Welcome to another message from Columbus First Assembly. Thanks for listening as we strive to learn and live the Word and ways of God. Our hope is that you're encouraged by today's message. I know that you're not supposed to be judgmental, but I have a confession to make. Sometimes I still am. Have you ever thought to yourself when looking at another person's decision, that's so stupid or that's just stupid? Well, that's just stupid. You know, you you look at how they're handling their finance. They've just bought this gigantic boat or some big vacation package, and and you you think about it, and, and you know, this is where the judgmental comes in. That's just stupid stupid. Or you're watching the way that they're maybe raising their kids and and you think, oh my goodness, what are they thinking? That's just stupid. Uh, My friend from many, many, many decades ago, most of you, if you've been here for any while, know I'm a big Star Trek fan. I'm a Star Wars fan too. Please, please don't mix them up. They are different. Some of you think that they are the same. They are not the same. I like them both, but they are different. But uh, Mr. Spock, that's not that not only is that illogical, that's just stupid. It's hard for us not to do that. It could be a coworker, it could be a boyfriend, a girlfriend, it could be your child, maybe your parents, a son-in-law or a daughter-in-law. Oh boy, and uh, you know wh- whatever it is that they're doing, you go, oh my goodness, oh that's just stupid. I think back of, of, of a family that I knew many, many years ago, many, many, many years ago, not here, please, I'm not talking about anybody here, many, many years ago, who, who would loan, kids, loan their kids money. They would loan their kids money because their, their child had some new business venture that they wanted to get into, and so they would loan them money. And, and I would hear about it, and I'm thinking, you're loaning them more money? They didn't pay back what you loaned them before. And they're, they're going into What? Oh my goodness, that's so stupid. That's what I think. I just, oh really? Um, that's what I say outside, you know. I know you guys, you do the same thing. You do the same thing. You want to think, are you nuts? You know they're never going to pay it back. There's a reason that I say that, and that'll be apparent here in just a moment. But I've entitled this message this morning, Atrocious Grace. That is a weird name. Atrocious grace. You can bring the title slide up. When you think of grace, you don't normally put a word like atrocious with it. Atrocious is usually negative. Oh my goodness. Atrocious grace. And I picked up this term from author Philip Yancey. And later in the message, I'll explain why I entitled the message Atrocious Grace. But I want to invite you this morning to turn in your Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, the 18th chapter. And we're going to read a story that Jesus told. And the reason I started the message by saying, that's just stupid, is because when I read this story, and I think about this story, that's one of my responses. See, Jesus tells about a king who let someone get into so much debt to him that you say, that's just stupid. Why would you ever do that? That, That's just stupid. For you to allow someone to get into that much debt or for you to borrow that much money, that's just stupid. And that's exactly when I read this story, what I think about and have thought about, even though I know what the story means, and even though I, uh, I understand what the, the Holy Spirit is trying to teach, sometimes I put myself in the context of hearing this for the first time. And if you heard this story for the very first time, as those who heard it when Jesus told it, you're going to sit there and go, that's stupid. That's just stupid. You would not do that. But it was done. And so would you follow along with me as I read this text, and then I'm going to go back through and unpack it just a little bit. It's Matthew's Gospel, 18th chapter, starting in verse number 21. Then Peter came to him, and the hymn is Jesus. Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times. No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. 
And then he tells this story that makes me think, and you would have thought hearing it the first time, that's just stupid. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared with. And when Jesus is always, and I've talked about this term before, when Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like, he's talking about God's dealing with man, man's dealing. This is, applies to us. We're part of the kingdom of God, and therefore, this applies to us. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me, and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me, and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put into prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man who had, he, whom he had forgiven and said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid the entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. We have a rich king. He loans money to others, probably for investment purposes. They use the money, they earn money, they return it. There's a man who he loaned an incredible amount of money. Now, the, the Greek, the English, the New Living Translation says uh, he, he owed millions of dollars. Actually, the Greek says it was 10,000 talents. Now, that is a, a, that is a, a, a monetary term from that day. 10,000 talents is a lot. Let me explain how much it really is. One talent equals 6,000 denarii. Now, a denarii or a denarii is a day's wage for a common labor. So one of those talents equaled 6,000 days wages. 10,000 talents in our economy would be this. It's not millions of dollars, folks. It's not. In our economy, 10,000 talents is between three and four billion dollars. That's why I say this is just stupid. This king is not very good at handling his money, nor is this man very good at either investing or doing whatever he's going to do with his money. Because to be, now, our federal government, yes, I, I understand, they do this. But for a person to be between three and four billion dollars in debt to one man, that's just stupid. It really is. And when I read this, that's the thought that I have. Now, please understand, that's exactly what Jesus wants you to feel. Sometimes we don't like the feelings we get when we read the Bible. When Jesus told this story, the people that he was telling the story to would not believe that anybody would ever loan anyone 10,000 talents because that's just stupid. This guy can't be trusted. I mean, you keep coming to the king, say, hey, I need, um, I need another talent, and I need another talent, and I need another talent, or I need, give me 5,000 of those talents. And this king keeps giving this man all of this money. He's not seeing any return on his investment. Finally, he just decides, well, first of all, he's got to be incredibly wealthy. Finally, he just decides he's going to bring things up to account, and he finds out that over the years, he has loaned this man 10,000 talents Three to four billion dollars, he decided, yeah, I'm, it's time to get this back. So he says, pay up. Well, the man's terrified. Because he knows he doesn't have this amount of money. He has very little. He has squandered it somehow, probably played the lottery or got into some shady investment someplace. And this money is now gone. 
So the king says, well, we're going we're gonna to get at least as much as I can get back from you. So I'm going to sell you, I'm going to sell your wife, I'm going to sell your family, all of your possessions. We might be able to get back a little bit of this when the man falls on his knees and begs the king, give me more time. I think that's just stupid. The man's got to be smart enough to know he's not going to be able to somehow get back 10,000 talents, but he begs for more time. At which point the master says, the, the scripture says this. Then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released them, him and forgave the debt. Now, the people in that day are going to be going, you've got to be kidding. That's just stupid. Three to four billion dollars? You're just releasing and forgiving? I mean, they're, they're sitting back there. They, they can't really make sense of this story. Now, they know Jesus is telling a story, and the story has a point he's trying to make, but the amounts are so large that they cannot comprehend it. And they're walking along just like I am. That's stupid. At least get something back from the guy. You know, sell his home, sell his possessions. But no, he's totally released, totally forgiven. Again, my mind, and it's okay to do this with the scripture, and if you don't think I should, that's fine. If lightning strikes me up here, then you'll have seen something really interesting in church that you've never seen before for thinking this way. But I think this king is a moron. This king is a moron. And then Jesus, of course, tells us who this king is, and it's Father God. Because in verse 35, it says, that's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Now, in relation to this man going out and not forgiving someone a small death, the small death was uh, what is called... Um, I got to find it. It's 100 denarii, so it's 100 days wages, so a few thousand, a few thousand dollars, and he wouldn't forgive. But verse 35 is real key because it says, that's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart, which means that the heavenly father also does what this king did up at the top. And he forgives incredible debts. And all of a sudden, this story is not so stupid anymore. Because this is my story, and this is your story. Because we have debts we can't pay. And God offers a gift to release us from the debt. When we come to him in repentance, he releases us. We're no longer condemned. We're no longer doomed. He's not going to cut us off. We get to come to him, and he's going to forgive. There was an old song that I learned years ago. Some of you may remember it, called He Paid a Debt He Did Not Owe. We're not going to sing it. I'm not going to play it. But basically, the first line goes this way. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins way. When I read the story in the context of me being the man with an incredible debt, I'm really glad this king is generous. He is not a moron. He's very loving and forgiving. God himself paid a debt he did not owe through Jesus Jesus is actually the one who paid the debt, and I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. Here's a statement coming up. It's in your notes. If you, don't, if you didn't take a bulletin, you may want to write this down because this is so key. Grace costs nothing for the recipients but everything for the giver. It costs this man nothing to have three to four billion dollars worth of debt wiped out. That king, it cost him all of it. 
You have a debt you cannot pay. But Jesus is going to pay it all. Grace costs nothing for the recipients, but everything for the giver. It costs God everything by his son dying for us to receive grace. John 3, verses 16 and 17. Many of you have this memorized. For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Grace comes out of love. And God loves you and me and the world so much that he is willing to pay your debt, has already paid your debt, and makes it available as a gift. Romans 6.23 says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That man owed that debt. You owe your sin debt. You owe it. You are either going to pay it or you can accept a free gift and let someone else pay it for you. This is the essence of the good news, which we call the gospel. Gospel means good news. Is that you have a debt you cannot pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. Because the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is not, you know, three to four billion dollars to be returned. It's not punishment with a whip on your back, the wages of sin is death. Spiritual death, eternal death, eternal separation from God, and you've earned it. I've earned it. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. You say, well, I'm not that bad. And I wasn't either. And so for a long time, I thought that I'm not that bad, I'm doing okay until I began to really understand what the Scripture says. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 64, verse 6, and this will not come up on the screen. You might write it down and look for it later. All of us have become like one who is unclean. That means by sin. And this is what Isaiah says. And all of our righteous acts, all of our good deeds, all of our righteous acts, just shine in front of the Lord. No, that's not what it says. All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. The best you can do is still like a filthy rag before God who is ultimately holy. The best you can do is no better than a filthy rag before God who is holy. That's why you and I need someone to pay our debt. And your debt is large. In high school... I didn't do what a lot of my friends did because I grew up in a church setting and I knew God was unhappy with some of the activities that were going on in high school and in my college setting. I didn't do those things, so I felt that "Mm, I must be pretty good in front of God because I'm certainly not as bad as (laughs) I remember. Well, I remember him. Oh, man. Things that he said went down over the weekend. This was at PE class. Things that he said went down. Who knows? Most of them might have been made up. I certainly wasn't as bad as him, so I felt pretty good. I felt pretty good when I walked into church. I felt pretty good when I... prayed occasionally. Until I became very convinced, because I finally heard what the truth is. His sin and my sin are still an unpayable debt There's a free gift available. Why have I used this term atrocious grace? Philip Yancey in his book, So What's So Amazing About Grace, said this, and the quote is in your notes, it's on the screen. The more I reflect on Jesus' parables, the more I am tempted to reclaim the word atrocious to describe the mathematics of the gospel. The amount that we are forgiven, the amount absorbed by God, the debt forgiven for you alone and me alone, the debt forgiven is atrocious. It is mind-boggling. It is mind-boggling. Our debt, 
And this is the main point that I really want the Holy Spirit to drive home. I felt that he wanted me to speak this morning, and if I get this across, I've done what he wanted me to do. Your life, your sin, your death, for most of you, it's already been taken care of. But you need to remember this. You need to remember how big it was, how vast it was, how atrociously bad it was in compared to a wonderful God. Your sin, your sin was atrocious. It was audacious, it was vast, and it was unpayable. And God's grace is equally audacious, vast, and atrocious. And it doesn't make sense. Your sin, my sin, our debt of sin was atrocious, vast, audacious, and unpayable. And God's grace is equally atrocious, vast, and audacious. It doesn't make sense. And if you try, here's the thing, if you try to make sense of it, it's just stupid. Because grace is not something you can really comprehend. It is an incredible, wonderful gift that God has given to us. And that's the whole point of the story Jesus told. This king kept accounts. He knew how much was owed him. Our king knows how much we have each sinned. And there's going to come a time of reckoning for each of us. For most of us here, I hope, the time of reckoning came when the Holy Spirit came upon you and convicted you and you repented. Because at that point, he forgives. But if you have not chosen yet personally, individually, to accept the free gift of God, you will, at some point, pay for the debt of your sin. And the payment for that debt is separation from God eternally in a place called hell. That is the truth. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And why does he do it? Because he loves us. A man by the name of J.P. Holuda, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, found this to be true. He was a young man, and he was a man who racked up quite a bit of debt. The debt of sin was much more than mine, but in comparison to God's righteousness, it doesn't really matter. We're all in the same pool, because maybe he did it, I thought it. Let's hear his story on this video. And they say drug, sex, and, and rock and roll, in my case, drug, sex, and hip-hop was, was really the, the college years. And um, as I said, Christianity was a bunch of rules. You know, don't watch R-rated movies, you know, don't, don't do drugs, don't get drunk, uh, don't stay out past curfew, and don't have sex. And the first week of college, I had broke every single one of those rules in epic proportions. After college, I, I moved to Dallas and now was in the big city and, and, uh, and I thought, well, I'll start going to church. And so I would sit in the back and I would just daydream for an hour and I was hung over. I, I would often smell like smoke from the, the night before. And there was just something around the truth and the authority that the guy up there had and, and the way that he read from the scriptures, like he believed it. And so I said, I, I believed in that moment that there was a God. I was like, I got to find out who he is. And, and, and really my bias was against Christianity. I thought, what are the odds that I'd be born into America where, you know, a lot of people are Christian. Like if I was born in India, I'd be Hindu. If I was born in Iran, I'd be Muslim. If, if I was born in Jordan, I might be Jewish and, and yet China, I'd be Buddhist. And so I started looking at, at the world religions and looking at other faiths with, really with a bias against Christianity. And I looked at, you know, Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, Church of Christian Science, Scientology. And I kept coming back to this character, Jesus Christ. Um, and, and I started wrestling with this idea, did he really live? He's the most polarizing character in the history of the world. I've, I've now been in the jungles of Africa and, and they know of Jesus. I've been in the jungles of the Amazon on a boat, you know, for, for over a week and get off and, and somebody knew about Jesus there. And, and uh, you know, people love him, people hate him. People get uncomfortable when you say his name. And, 
And so I just kept coming back to the character of Jesus and every, every religion out there that I'd look at, they would acknowledge that, that he existed. And even some of the most renowned atheists of today would acknowledge that he existed. And I started thinking about that. And I was like, this guy changed the calendar. Something happened BC before Christ, AD now, the year of our Lord. And, and he was, but as I looked at him, he was this nobody from nowhere, Nazareth, you know, born in Bethlehem, a town I can't even point to on a map. And as I, I learned more about Jesus, you know, just I think the message of love that he has continued to overwhelm me, just that, that, he, that he loves us, that he loves us so much that he died for us. I, that was something I had heard my entire life. You know, Jesus died for your sins. Jesus died for your sins. But I never really thought about just this idea that, that someone literally gave their life for me, that they suffered, that they were tortured. And they did that because I, I was a porn addict, because I was a sex addict, because I was an alcoholic in, in the sense that I drank every day, that, that I was a drug user, that I was constantly looking for the next thrill in life, and, and that, that God was, that, that He literally, He sent Jesus to die, to, that He bled for those things, and that Christianity wasn't really this list of rules that I had to obey it was really a story about someone coming to rescue me because I can't. The story of Jesus is someone coming to rescue me because I can't. This morning, I feel in my own heart and spirit that there is someone here and I definitely know someone or two or more listening via audio. Who this morning, you need to understand that your life apart from Jesus, you're not opening your heart personally to him. Maybe you didn't even know you needed to do it. See, I grew up in a religious system that told me if I did enough good stuff, it would outweigh the bad stuff. And when I stood before God, I'd get in. That was the religious system I grew up in. That's why when I looked at my high school buddies who were out doing everything I was thinking about, I just knew that when I stood before God, he'd look at me, and then he'd look at Jeff over there, say, yeah, come on in, Rick, until I found out that the truth of what happened to Jesus, the truth of the gospel is my sin and Jeff's sins we're pretty equal. And we were both way over here. And there was no way we could approach a righteous God. For the wages of sin is death. And I had racked up a lot of wages. But by the grace of God and the love of God and some people who knew what the gospel message was, I met some folks that told me that Jesus loved me just the way that I was. And that he died for my sin, and I don't earn my way to God. I don't do better than Jeff. I don't do better than Sam. I just come to him and admit I am a sinner, and I need rescue. See, the story of Jesus is someone coming to rescue me because I can't rescue myself. I'm like that young man there in the water. I have no chance. I have no chance if someone doesn't reach down and lift me out. I have a debt I cannot pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. And he came and lifted me out. And it is a free gift. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God the free gift of grace, the free gift of God's love is available to anyone who will receive it. If that man in the water doesn't reach out his hand to grasp the hand and receive the rescue, he will drown. If you have not yet received the free gift of God, the forgiveness of your sins, and then choosing to follow him, he will reach down today and pick you up. And it doesn't matter how deep your sin is. Jesus talked about the atrocious grace of God 
by being so over the top in his example of someone owing three to four billion dollars or in that economy 10,000 talents that would never be paid by anyone. It was more in my study, it was more than the taxes. Over 10 years of taxes that was being collected in certain places of Israel, one person could never pay that. It was a huge sum of money. And again, it, it's stupid to us that someone would get into that much debt. But you and I have gotten into that much debt of sin. Now, most of us have already received it, already received the grace, already received the free gift. But today, you will have an opportunity if you have not. We are all going to pray a prayer together. And if this is truly the prayer you wish to pray, I'm going to lead it in about another five minutes. But Jesus didn't end the story here, and I need to talk to you about the rest of the story just briefly to give context and also to be faithful to God's word. He went on. That man received this incredible gift of being forgiven three to four billion dollars because the king had pity on him. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars, a hundred denarii. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. And Jesus actually had this man use the exact same words that this guy who just walked out and was forgiven, the same words. That's why you're thinking, where is this guy coming from? Didn't he just... The fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I'll pay it, he pleaded. Same words that this man just used probably not more than five minutes, ten minutes ago to the king. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. Other people saw it. They went and they told the king about it. And then verse 35 said, That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Let me, let me share something with you. And one of the reasons I spent so much time on the amount that you and I, those who have already received the forgiveness of God, have been rescued from is, I think, I can only speak from my heart, but I think my heart is probably like your heart. I think. When we forget how much forgiveness we've received, that is when we begin to be unwilling to forgive others. And I think it's a good thing for us to remember. If you're having trouble forgiving someone, or if bitterness has come into your heart, or you're holding a grudge, or you just can't release something, what you need to do is to go back and realize how much you were forgiven. If you will focus there, it will become easier to release those who have sinned against you us. You owed a debt you could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. You walked away from God the Father, debt-free, totally forgiven of sin. That's how good God is and how much God loves you. Yancey has one more quote from the book that I wish to share with you. He says this, if I care to listen I hear a loud whisper from the gospel that I did not get what I deserve. If I care to listen, I hear a loud whisper from the gospel that I did not get what I deserved. I deserved punishment and got forgiveness. I deserved wrath and got love. I deserved debtor's prison and got instead a clean credit history. I deserve stern lectures and crawl on your knees repentance. I got a banquet spread for me. And that's what you and I also got when we received the grace of God. Pastor Richard, Richard Exley, in his one-minute devotion, shared this. It's not in your notes, but it's coming up on the screen. Justice is getting what you deserve. That's what we expect when we come to God, justice. Mercy is not getting what you deserve, but grace is getting what you don't deserve. This grace is available for any of your sin. Grace is available for stupid sin. Anybody have some stupid sin in their life? Betsy, you're the one person I wouldn't have expected to get that response for. I guess the older we are, the more we're aware of the stupid sins in our life. I, she's one of our great saints. Grace is available for stupid sin. Hear this. Hear this. Grace is available for intentional 
sin. God didn't make a distinction. There are some things I intentionally did. I wanted to do them. There are some things I intentionally allowed myself to feel anger and hatred and bitterness. There are some places on the internet I intentionally went to knowing what God said. And grace is available for intentional sin also. Some people feel that they can't come to God because, because they have lived in such a way that how would God receive them? He would receive you in the exact same way he received this man. Graciously and forgiving. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. But the love of God is available for you today. And if you're one who maybe at one time was like the man on the video, he grew up in church and he thought it was a whole bunch of rules and regulations. And yes, God has some rules and regulations. They're for our good, not to get right with God. But as soon as he got free from the rules and regulations, he went and lived the life he wanted to. But he found out that there was a God who was willing to rescue him and forgive him. And he accepted that free gift. Maybe you at one time had accepted the free gift and then you went and lived the life that you wanted to live. But somehow or other you're listening today or you're actually here physically in, in, in this service. And the Holy Spirit is talking to you and saying, he's talking about you. He's talking about you. This moment today, he is ready to receive you back into the family or into the family for the very first time because our God has atrocious grace. The team makes their way back to the platform. If you need to receive God's grace and forgiveness today, just know that God loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus to pay the debt of sin to die in your place. He is offering this grace. He is offering this forgiveness. He's offering this love to you right now, free of charge, no cost. All you have to do is reach out and receive it. I'm going to lead you in a prayer in just a moment, and I'm going to ask you to pray some words out loud. But what I'm going to do is I am going to ask everyone this morning to pray this prayer out loud. Therefore, the one who needs to pray it can pray it and not feel that they're praying by themselves. And then I'll give some additional direction. Bow your heads, and then I'll tell you when I want you to pray. Lord, you have reminded us that the wages of sin is death. And Lord, so there may be, I, I'm, I'm certain there are probably some here, because you have put this heavy on my heart, that there are some here this morning that are in that place. They are living with the wages of sin eternal death and separation from you in their life right now. But Lord, they are just moments away from receiving the free gift of God, which is eternal life through our Savior, Jesus, our Lord. Lord, I pray that you speak to everyone who is in need of praying this prayer, that they would see their need and that they would humbly reach out to you for your love and for your goodness. And this morning, be rescued in Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm not going to have you raise your hand. I'm not going to have you identify yourself. Our Lord, our Lord is the one who knows. But if you would like to receive the free gift of God this morning, as everyone prays this prayer, you pray it and mean it. Say, Lord Jesus, I recognize that I have a debt of sin that I cannot repay. I need someone to pay for me this debt. And I have heard today that Jesus already paid that debt and is offering to me a gift. Lord, I am not worthy 
to receive this gift. But I will receive it. Lord, I confess that I am a sinner and that my sin has separated me from you. Today, I receive the free gift of the forgiveness of my sins and eternal life in Jesus. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. My friends, I did exactly what you did many, many years ago when I finally knew the truth. The how I lived didn't make any difference. What I needed was a gift. I received that gift. I was by myself. I wasn't in a church service. I received that gift, and my life was transformed. My sins were truly forgiven. Now, I wasn't perfect. I still intentionally sinned. I still stupid sinned. I did a lot of things, but I continued to walk with God. And it's now been 40 plus years. It is worth it. It's not going to be easy. There will be challenges. But God loves you. Welcome to the family if you prayed that prayer. You know, we could substitute love. We could substitute the word grace. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless grace of God. Because His grace and His love are intertwined. That's what God is. He's given to you. Would you stand? I'm going to pray for someone here that I just have a sense. I don't know who you are. I'm not going to call you out. But I'm going to describe something. And you're going to know that I'm talking about you. Someone here this morning is really still having a very difficult time dealing with a, a very deep wound, a very deep hurt. I don't know exactly how it manifests in your heart. And you have read this passage of Scripture before, and it's been very difficult for you. And I'm not downplaying the hurt that you have received. But you don't want to live there because it has an impact on you, a terrible impact on you. And I'm not going to give you some pep talk. All that I believe the Holy Spirit wants you to do is to spend the next few weeks remembering how gracious He has been to you, how much He forgave you. Think back to your past. Now, maybe it's not as bad as the person who injured you or hurt you, but think back to your past. You had a debt you couldn't pay, but He paid a debt did not know. As you meditate on that and then ask the Holy Spirit to begin to break in your heart that which has been bogging you down for months if not years because you need to be free. Jesus doesn't want you to live there. You make, need to make the decision to let that go. When you give that person grace, remember, it's costing you. It costs you everything. You lost whatever it was to that individual. It costs you everything. And they're the recipients freely of it. But so were we. It cost God everything. And we're the recipients of the free gift. You couldn't earn it. You don't deserve it. But still, God gave himself away to us. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Lord, this morning, we thank you for your grace, atrocious grace, amazing grace, atrocious grace, whatever term we give it, it is incredible. May we dwell today about what you have given us. May it get deep in our heart. Lord, for those this morning that prayed that prayer, may they be quick to respond. For anyone else who has a need here this morning, may they feel a freedom to come and receive prayer. For your spirit is here desiring to touch lives. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. God loves you. There is nothing you have ever done that has changed his love for you. There's nothing you will ever do that will change his love for you. He loves you. Have a wonderful day. If you need prayer, these folks are here for you. You've been listening to a message from Columbus First Assembly. 
We hope that you've been encouraged in your spiritual journey. If you are not part of a local church and would like to attend one of our regular services, our church is located at the corner of 10th and Iowa Street in Columbus, Indiana. Our Sunday morning worship services start at 10 a.m. and our Wednesday evening studies begin at 7 p.m. And while you're online, check out our website at columbusfirstassembly.org for details and information about our church. You will also find other messages and series that you can listen to or download. Thanks for spending some time with us and for taking advantage of this resource from Columbus First Assembly, where we strive to learn and live the word and ways of God.